Hey everyone, Russ Barkley here with another commentary related to ADHD. This particular topic was suggested by a subscriber, Chris. Chris, thanks so much. We're going to talk today about the relationship of ADHD to an undiagnosed sleep disorder, particularly obstructive sleep apnea. This is raised as a question because there are some websites out there, particularly this one by Dr. Stephen Lynn, who is a registered dentist in New South Wales, Australia, who has an Instagram account in which he posted this commentary about ADHD possibly being the result of undiagnosed sleep disorder. Uh, and in this, he even raises a bit of research that was done suggesting that children with obstructive sleep apnea might have reduced gray matter volumes, particularly in the areas related to attention and more generally ADHD and motor control. So uh, let's have a look at this question. I mean, uh, we certainly know that kids with ADHD and adults have sleeping difficulties, but, but what's the relationship and, and is it causal? I mean, in this post on Instagram, this dentist is suggesting that sleep apnea or an undiagnosed sleep disorder more generally might be a, if not the major cause of ADHD. Well, is it? Before we get started here, let's have a look over at a recent review of gray matter volumes and sleep dysfunction in the general population. Uh, so it, is it true that sleep apnea is going to lead to a reduction in gray matter volume, as was argued on that Instagram post? Well, this review of the literature says that we just don't know yet. There do appear to be some findings suggesting that certain sleep disorders might be related to gray matter thickness, perhaps a reduction in gray matter volumes. Some of these sleep disorders are REM sleep behavior disorder, obstructive sleep apnea, that's the topic that we're interested in today, restless leg syndrome, and even insomnia. But the review goes on to point out that the relationship here isn't very clear. One can't go on to conclude that the gray matter volume reductions are a result of the sleep problem. Maybe, maybe not. As the reviewers argue, it could also be that the sleep problems are presenting as complex disease states and may have associated with them the reduction in gray matter. In other words, they don't cause each other they have a relationship to each other because they're all signs of an underlying sleeping difficulty that is related to the brain. Moreover, the review points out that the findings in the literature are incredibly inconsistent. Some studies are finding a reduction in gray matter volume related to these sleep disorders. Other studies find just the opposite. There is an increase in certain areas of the gray matter. So, uh, as they point out, it is hardly clear what the relationship is here at all between gray matter volumes and sleep disorders, particularly in this case, our interest in sleep apnea. So let's bring up my PowerPoint presentation and let's take a look at what we seem to know so far. I spent some time today going back into this literature just to reacquaint myself with it. And let me tell you what I have found. So. What is the relationship of obstructive sleep apnea specifically, or more generally sleep disordered breathing, which is a larger category, to ADHD? All right, let's have a look. We know that up to 40% or more of children and teens, and even adults with ADHD, have sleeping difficulties. Trouble falling asleep, trouble staying asleep, frequent waking, restless leg syndrome, early rising, daytime sleepiness related to all of the above, inefficient sleep at that. There's a lot of difficulties going on in there. And yes, one of those difficulties is obstructive sleep apnea. Reviews suggest that about 18% and perhaps as high as 30% of children and teens with ADHD might have either the more general sleep disordered breathing or the more specific obstructive sleep apnea. 
On the other hand, if we reverse the way we ascertain patients, if we go out and look for children with OSA, sleep apnea, up to 90% of them have elevated symptoms of inattention. Now, hold on there a second. That doesn't mean they have ADHD. Just means they're more likely to be rated by parents and teachers as having inattention. Remember, inattention isn't clinical ADHD. That requires a much greater number of symptoms, a much greater variety of symptoms, including impulsivity and even hyperactivity, and that these rise to the level of being developmentally inappropriate and impairing and all the other criteria we use for the clinical diagnosis of ADHD. That's not what these studies are looking at. They're looking at ratings of inattention. So it makes sense then that children with obstructive sleep apnea may have inattention associated with that sleeping problem. It's not clear just from that that one leads to the other. They are related. But the extent to which OSA is causing clinical ADHD is unknown. And therefore, that dentist comment that OSA could be a major cause of ADHD is um, unsupported. Let's just put, be kind and say the evidence doesn't support that at this time. So it's unclear how many children with sleep apnea have a clinical diagnosis of ADHD. Most of the research on sleep apnea doesn't assess for that. It uses parent and teacher ratings of certain symptoms and other behavior besides ADHD as well. So is OSA a major cause of ADHD in children? As this dentist suggests, no. But the two conditions do appear to be related to each other and they may well be interacting with each other in an adverse way. So in other words, sleep apnea could worsen inattention. And if a child already has ADHD, Yes, it could make some of their symptoms worse. But also likely is that ADHD and its many sleeping difficulties may also be contributing to sleep apnea. And they are bidirectional. They interact to make each other worse. Now, just as an aside, I did come across a very recent paper on a very large sample of adults in the general population that looked at whether or not a parent's sleep apnea was predictive of risk for ADHD in their children. And it showed that there was an 80% increase in risk of ADHD in parents if the father had sleep apnea and more than double the risk of ADHD in the offspring of these parents if the mother had sleep apnea. Again, all this is showing is that sleep apnea may be related to ADHD. It doesn't mean it's causing it. And indeed, in these adults, having sleep apnea might well be a marker that the parent is also ADHD. And that's where the child's ADHD is coming from, not from parental sleep apnea. Just an interesting finding there. But once again, illustrating the point, I keep hammering home to this audience, and that is correlations cannot be used to imply causation, not in and of themselves. So back to the point, it does appear that there's a relationship between OSA and inattention in children. This relationship could make mean that sleep apnea worsens the inattention. If a child already has ADHD, it is doubtful that it would cause ADHD the clinical disorder, de novo, completely by itself. And other evidence we have that that is the case is the genetics of ADHD. The vast majority of variation in the population in ADHD, as you know, is related to variation in our genetics. And therefore, there's very little room left over in these calculations for this kind of an environmental or biological cause of ADHD as being a primary cause. But it doesn't mean it's not making things worse. It might well be. And if a child was already well down the road toward ADHD, it might push them further into the clinically diagnosable range. Now, another way of testing this relationship, which has been done in the literature, is to take a look 
at surgical interventions for sleep apnea, most commonly it's removal of the adenoids and tonsils, known as an adenotonsillectomy. We'll just call it surgery for the sake of this presentation. What do, what do those studies find? Well, there have been a number of those studies. Does surgery help? Well, most of the studies simply did pre-post comparisons of children who had sleep apnea, who then underwent surgery for removal of the adenoids and tonsils. And all of these studies show improvement in inattention and to some extent, even in other ADHD symptoms. But mind you, these are not randomized controlled trials. This is just, we looked at them before the intervention, we did the surgery, we looked at them later, and we're seeing significant improvement in their symptoms. It's not clear that it was necessarily the surgery. So let's take a look at the better studies. There have been several randomized trials of children with sleep apnea, some of who got surgery, and others of whom got methylphenidate, or were simply put on a watch list and followed over time. What do these studies show? They show that there's little, if any, evidence of improvement in neuropsychological tests of attention, impulsivity, executive functioning, and so on. However, there is significant improvement in parent and teacher ratings of inattention in daytime functioning. And a few of the studies suggested some improvements in other ADHD type symptoms, such as impulsivity and hyperactivity, but inattention and improvement in inattention appear to be the major domains of findings. Now, what about children with ADHD? Did the surgery help them? The answer is yes. When children with ADHD, at least in one study, were randomized to surgery, methylphenidate treatment, or a weightless control group, they found that the surgery was slightly but significantly better than the methylphenidate in improving symptoms. But both of those interventions resulted in significant improvements in sleep behavior and in daytime inattentiveness compared to the weightless control group. The improvements range from about 36 to up to 85% improvement as a result of the surgery or the methylphenidate. The surgery, as I've said, was somewhat better at these improvements. Now, while these improvements in sleep and behavior appeared in some of these studies to last up to six months, longer term studies remain to be done. We don't know how long these benefits last, but they do appear to survive into a few months or longer after surgery. So in conclusion, it appears that children with obstructive sleep apnea do benefit from surgical interventions in improving their sleep behavior, their snoring, and their daytime inattentiveness. And yes, it does appear that children with ADHD who have sleep apnea do seem to benefit from surgical intervention in improving their inattention and sleep. But those children also benefited nearly as much from being put on stimulant medication. So perhaps the conclusion so far is if an ADHD child has signs of disordered breathing and particularly obstructive sleep apnea, then first we might consider trying them on stimulant medication to see if it improves daytime behavior, does it improve their sleeping, and does it improve their inattention? And only where those results are not impressive, one might consider, consider the surgical intervention. Or perhaps you might just go straight away to the surgical intervention. But remember, there are some risks of surgery relative to simply using medication. But in the end, if surgery is chosen, it does look like there's going to be some improvement in sleeping and in daytime attentiveness but we don't know whether such surgical interventions lead to any reductions in clinical ADHD diagnoses in children who had such diagnoses before undergoing their surgery. We just don't know that at this time. So it's a lot more complex picture than 
our dentist, Dr. Steve Lynn, portrayed it in that Instagram post. But there does appear to be some relationship here, and as I've said, some benefits for some children in improving their daytime inattention from surgery. But back to my initial point, the vast majority of children with ADHD do not have obstructive sleep apnea. So it's not a major cause of their disorder. But as we said, it could worsen their daytime inattention if they have such sleeping difficulties. And in that case, surgical intervention might be beneficial for that subset of children. Thanks for joining me for this commentary. I look forward to seeing you again on this channel with other commentaries and my weekly Saturday research review. And until then, everybody, live well and be well. Thank you.